chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 are going to be our text this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4. And if you're new here this morning, welcome. I'm Pastor Matt. I'm your regular teaching pastor here. So we are thrilled to have you here. Thrilled that you came to spend your Sunday morning with us. Uh, and let me say, this, this is our Lord's Supper day, so that means all the kids are in service with us. And I do have to say, Mom and Dad, your kids are not going to bother me. They're probably going to bother you more than I'm, I'm even going to notice that they're there. So, don't worry about it. You don't have to hush them, you don't have to tell them to be quiet or anything like that. They're kids, I understand, and it's a joy to have them in here with us so they can watch us, us worship. One of the greatest joys I have on Sunday mornings is being able to stand with my children and worship God and have them see mom and dad worship. So with that, let's read our text. Uh, we're going to read 12 all the way through the end of the chapter, so it's verse 19, and then we'll pray. So this is what... Peter, the apostle, wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need help this morning. We need help because our hearts are often dull and often don't see and grasp the reality of your word. So this morning, we pray that you would come and help us to understand it, that you would impress upon our minds the reality of your word, that you would call us to uh, deep fellowship with you, that you would call us out of darkness into your marvelous light for those who do not currently know you, Lord. And Father, I pray that your word would land upon us which, which, with such force that we can't help but obey. So Lord, come and do a work this morning. Holy Spirit, work on our hearts. And Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you died on the cross. And thank you that even now you are interceding at the right hand of the Father for us. What an amazing thing that is. Lord, help me not to twist your word, to manipulate it to my own ends but may it be clear for your people, edifying for their souls. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know if I ever told you about the a particular incident that happened in my life, not something I did, but something that happened uh, with those related to me at a particular point. And it's, it's the case of the Bible burning. Now this is an interesting uh, period of my life as being an immature believer, thinking that I know all things and understand the great wisdoms of the Word of God, and being around like-minded young men. And one of these young men got into his head that there was only one particular version of the Bible that was the actual Word of God. And any other translation was, in effect, false. 
So he thought, well, the right thing to do then would be to get rid of these other Bibles. So he made a spectacle where I believe the first one that he had when he was on spring break at home, he set up as a target and took his shotgun out and played around. And then after he was satisfied that he had shot it enough, he burned it. And then he came back to school and started to tell everybody about this great deed he did. Well, the faculty and the dean got wind of what happened, and they said to him, what you've done is not right. You need to repent of your sins. To which he played the Luther card, give me some time to think about this, and I'll come back. Well, in that time, he came to talk with me and said, what can I do? And I said, well, your only real legitimate option is to repent of what you've done. And he said, but in words of Luther, I can't recant. And I said to him, what in the world are you talking about? You've just destroyed a Bible, and you're letting that conviction you have potentially ruin everything for you. Well, I, I'm unable to recant of this can't go back. Okay, that's where you want to stand, fine. That's where you can stand. Well, his stance led to his expulsion. And he never pursued, as far as I know, what he had so desired to pursue in ministry. It's an interesting case, interesting case study from life. And I'm sure he's not the only one that's ever done anything like this. But there's a reality that we need to grasp this morning. Right? It's this. Not, not all suffering that we experience in life qualifies as Christian suffering. Not all suffering that we experience in life qualifies as Christian suffering. Now, Peter started this last exhortation here in verse 12 about suffering by saying, do not be surprised. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes. Now, for Peter, the fiery trial could manifest in a host of different ways. And for those Living in the first century, the, the prospects of a fiery trial or of persecution was more likely than it is in our culture, though our culture is steadily marching in that direction into making the norm be a, a rejection of Christianity. But those that Peter wrote to in the first century did not have the luxury now listen, they did not have the luxury of their religion being the accepted, sanctioned religion. Or they didn't even have the right to a personal religion. Rather, in the Roman Empire, there was only one religion, one right and sanctioned religion, and that was emperor worship. We talked about this a few months ago, where in the first century... You could get uh, out of having to be persecuted if you simply said, Caesar is Lord, by which true Christians can never say, because Jesus is Lord. No other person is. So the emperor worship was the only right and sanctioned worship, with all other belief systems having a degree of tolerance. And that all depended on who was in charge and which region you lived in. Some regions were more accommodating, others were not. But yet, Christianity in the first century, those who Peter was writing to, did not have the luxury of a sanctioned right to religious freedom. And because of this, 
uh, or because of this Christianity of the first century, there was, it was given a small amount of toleration as long as it wasn't disruptive. As long as Christianity didn't disrupt life, didn't disrupt the, the governing region, didn't cause riots or any problems, predominantly the governors in the area and the, the rulers would just look past it. It wouldn't be a problem. But this caused significant problems for the first century church. Because those who follow, uh, those who became followers of Jesus had gone through quite the transformation. And that transformation led them to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. It led them to tell other people that Caesar is not actually Lord, but Jesus is. Therefore, you need to follow Jesus. Now, this religious view ran contrary to the accepted and the sanctioned religion of the empire. It was seen as subversive. It was seen as potentially destroying the very foundations of the Roman Empire, which those in power could not allow to happen. And also, although Christianity was somewhat tolerated, issues arose or began to arise because the nature of Christianity means that we proclaim. Brothers and sisters, the nature of our faith, that which you hold dear, that which you profess, means that you actually proclaim that you actually speak of the word of God to other people, that you actually tell people that Jesus is king. We sang that song this morning, that he is king. And we are called to do that proclaiming in the world. Because if we truly believe that our Jesus is king and that he is Lord of lords, and that he has come with the message of salvation, and he has come to bring freedom from oppression, from the oppression that we put upon ourselves, then that message ought to be on our lips every second of the day. Because it means freedom for everybody who believes. The, subver the subversive nature of the Christian faith becomes apparent quickly. Christianity pulls people out of the world. We pull them, literally pull them out of their positions in the world and into the body of Christ, transforming them and transforming their allegiances. And what happened in the first century and what happens continually today when people come to Christ is that families are disrupted because one spouse becomes a Christian and the other one doesn't. And then children hear the gospel and believe in Christ and follow Christ, causing conflict with parents and other siblings. Christians begin to leave their jobs because what they were doing prior to their faith is now incompatible with life. We got some people at the door. Can we let them in? Yep. Thank you. Yep. Go quick. There you go. <laughs> They're trying to come in. All right. There we go. All right. So families are disrupted. Christians begin to leave their jobs because their now new faith is incompatible with what they were doing prior. Or now they go into the workplace, which is possibly even better. They go into the workplace and they seek to transform the workplace. They seek to turn it upside down. 
and they seek to bring the gospel in, and they seek to bring the weight of the reality of Christ upon their place of employment so that they see change happen. And when this happens and and the world stands there aghast at the audacity of somebody bringing the word of God into the secular workplace, they fight back. And they say, you can't bring that here. But as Christians, our whole purpose is to proclaim, to proclaim the glory of our King. Therefore, as this is proclaimed, the world gets turned upside down as households, as businesses, and society feel the very shock of the gospel. Let me illustrate this for you. If you have your Bibles open, go ahead and and turn over to Acts chapter 16. I want to show you what happens when the shock of the gospel comes into a the world. Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 16. We'll read down through verse 24. Still hear pages. I'll give you a moment longer. All right. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the, the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul having become greatly annoyed, I'm surprised he lasted several days, becoming greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And and when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrate tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received orders, having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Paul and Silas are doing what every ordinary Christian is called to do, and that's proclaim the Word of God. And in doing that proclamation, this slave girl who is possessed by a demon comes and starts proclaiming along with them, saying, listen, crowds, these men come to proclaim to you the way of life. And as a result, after doing this for many days, Paul gets greatly annoyed, Can you imagine the commotion that she's uh, causing? And when he casts out the demon from her, her owners lose their livelihood. The very word of God turns their world upside down, and they cannot stand it. Therefore, they grab Paul and Silas, they take him, and their words are this, in verse 20, these men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Christians, when the world tells you you're disturbing our city by your your proclamation, by your preaching of the Word of God, 
You say, yes, I am. And you need to hear what's being said. Because this is life. And your path only leads to destruction. And as Paul and Silas give us the example, we don't see them complaining. We don't see them raising their voices and shouting, saying, we were just kidding. I, I'm sorry that I said those things. I'm sorry that we told you you were walking in sin. We were, we were just kidding. Don't harm us. Don't throw us in prison. Don't shame us. Rather, we see them silent, we see them beaten, and we see them thrown in prison because they are faithful to the Word of God. And they know the mission that God has given them. Therefore, they go willingly. And by their willing submission, God does something else. God saves his jailer and his household. God makes it possible for an entire family to hear the Word of God and to have their lives transformed and changed. As we walk as Christians, we should expect that at some point we will come up against a wall of hostility. In, in those cases, we can look back at, at what Peter has written and find encouragement to keep on walking. Paul and Silas found encouragement by the reality that they had known God to keep on walking, to be able to say to the world that said to them, your message is too disruptive, is not accepted here. They're able to say, no, our message is exactly what you need. Therefore, we are going to continue to go. And brothers and sisters, we can look at the suffering of Christ. We can look at, at what he went through on our behalf. And we can say that for, for certain, that if we suffer as Christians, if we suffer for the things of God, for the gospel of God, we can be sure that, that the same spirit that led Jesus through his ministry that led him through his suffering, is the same spirit that leads us. Because Jesus promised to us, and he said, I go away, but I'm not going to leave you alone, for I'm going to send the helper to you. And he will teach you all things. And I take that to mean that he's going to lead us in all things. That he's going to make it possible for us to walk through all things regardless of what may come. But in our Christian culture today, many people have reinterpreted suffering from their lifestyle to mean that they are suffering as Christians. We take any upsetting event in our lives and push it through the lens that we are now somehow suffering for the gospel. But this is deceptive. We deceive ourselves when we do that. Now, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, grasped this reality. And I think he grasped it because he had done the same thing in his life. And in an effort to comfort us, or sorry, in an effort for us to comfort ourselves, we often say that when we come across suffering, I'm suffering for Jesus. And we say that as just a blanket statement, regardless of what actually got us into that place of suffering in the first place. Regardless of what got you into your suffering, we often say, well, I'm suffering for Jesus. And we say that simply because we're Christian, or we think we're Christian. Therefore, in an effort to comfort ourselves, we say, I'm suffering for Jesus. But Peter, turn back to 1 Peter chapter 4. But Peter in verse 15 shatters that for us. This is what he says in verse 15. He says, But 
Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Our thinking often gets infected by the world to such a degree that our conclusions about life get quite distorted. And we twist the reality just enough to make ourselves feel better about our lives, about our decisions. But Peter, in the brash, quick-to-speak way, is having none of that. Instead, what he does is he shines a bright light on us, cast, uh, uh, contrasting for us what it means to suffer as a Christian with what it means to suffer for your sinful choices. And brothers and sisters, there's a difference here. There's a stark difference. And just in case you missed it, and we're having trouble with math or counting. Verse 15 follows verse 14. Let me read that for you. Peter says, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Therefore, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. With his very next Breath, Peter says to us, but. He says, but. That is to stop us. That is to stop us from going to the conclusion that, that Peter is saying to us that, hey, if you are suffering and you're a Christian, then, then you are blessed, regardless of what the suffering is. So we can say, yeah, I made this horrible choice over here to shoot a Bible with a shotgun and then light the thing on fire, and now I'm being uh, kicked out of my school as, I, as somehow I'm blessed, and I'm now suffering for Christ. Peter wants us to grasp the reality that there is different kinds of suffering. Suffering we bring upon ourselves and suffering that comes from us being faithful Christians by preaching the gospel or living the life of a Christian. Peter says in verse 15, 15 that if you find yourself suffering, make sure Make sure that your suffering is not because you are one of these things, a murderer, a thief, which, by the way, to be a murderer or a thief in the first century is a capital crime. You're dying for those actions. And he continues, or a person who does evil or a meddler, because if you are suffering, Peter says, as a result of your sinful behavior because of your choices, your suffering is your own doing. And brothers and sisters, it is just. And the sooner you accept responsibility and repent, the better. Brothers and sisters, the sooner that you accept responsibility for where you may currently be in life because of your decisions and repent, the better. My friend who destroyed the Bibles could not get to that point because he had believed so much in his mind. He had created such a narrative in his head that any of his actions here were absolutely and 100% correct. And he was justified to do it. And therefore, he stood there, putting himself in the position of a, of a Luther to say, I can't recant of these actions because I believe them to be right. He had made choices, decisions, 
that he had no biblical foundation for. Rather, they were decisions made out of his own wisdom, out of his own understanding. And this is where we get in trouble in life. This is where we find ourselves in, in awkward positions where we feel like we're backed into a corner. And I'm sure he felt like he was backed into a corner. But it was his pride that prevented him from repentance, not any right actions. In the place where we get ourselves in trouble, in the areas of life that we think, oh, that's just innocent. That's an innocent action. That's an innocent thing for me to do. And this is why I think Peter adds this last little phrase, the end of verse 15, where he says, or suffer as a meddler. See, he goes in descending order of significant sins within the culture and down to those that are benign, all the way to that of a meddler. Now, what is a meddler? Now, this is a person who just can't keep their nose out of other people's business. They are constantly looking over other people's shoulders, constantly having to interject their opinions, their desires, their wants, their thoughts into other people's lives, thinking that what they have is the best thing ever. And that everybody needs to hear it. All to the point where they really annoy people. Furthermore, this is, we see in this word meddler, that you force yourself into other people's lives, not for their sake, but in reality for your own sake, and for your own pleasure and satisfaction. I'm sure we've all met people like this before. They get that glean in their eyes. Oh, I can get into these people's lives, and now I can talk about what's going on in their lives, and I can do this, and I can do that. Oh, please don't be that person. All right, these are the people, according to Paul in 2 Thessalonians 3.11, that are busy bodies. Right? They're not busy making themselves useful, but are busy bodies. And as a result, they let their mouths free to annoy anybody and everybody they can. And they, call, and they cause constant trouble. They are troublemakers. This is why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. Brothers and sisters, if you're suffering because you annoyed people, that's on you. <laughs> Y'all think I'm, I'm kidding. I'm serious. <laughs> if you are suffering because you annoyed people, because you meddled too much in other people's affairs, that's on you. Dr. Schreiner, in talking about this passage, says this. He says, if believers act like busybodies, they will be considered to be pests who deserve ostracism and mistreatment. Peter wanted believers to refrain from acting tactless, tactlessly and without social graces. Peter says to us, brothers and sisters, listen, the fiery trial is going to, be, going to come. Don't be surprised that it's going to come. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Don't allow yourself to suffer because of your choices, bad choices. Paul and Silas were off preaching the gospel in Philippi. And this Slave girl comes and disrupts everything. And they're the ones that get the punishment and suffering for it. But their suffering, grasp this, their suffering is not because they made bad choices. 
Their suffering is because they took the gospel, which the world cannot bear to hear without the Holy Spirit doing a work in their hearts. And they took that gospel and preached it to anybody and everyone that would listen. And as a result, they suffered. That is Christian suffering. Not because you forced your way into other people's lives and made a pest of yourself or a nuisance or annoyed people. Not because you decided to walk in evilness by rejecting the very word of God and saying, I can live however I want. I can call myself whatever I want. I can choose to to have 50 million genders that I want. If you suffer because of those things, that is on you. And Peter says, your suffering is just because you're suffering for your own sinfulness. But brothers and sisters, as Christians, we are called not to do that, not to live that way. Listen, we are called to fix our eyes on Christ. We are called to be people who are no longer living according to the passions of the flesh, but according according to the love of God. So how do you respond to suffering, or how you respond to suffering depends on where your eyes are fixed. And I've really got to get going here. Holy cow. All right. So let me, let me go through this. All right. So we need, to, we need to listen to Peter's warning to make sure that we're not suffering as the world does. But because behind the suffering, or because... Uh, the, we need to make sure we don't suffer as the world does because the suffering that the world goes through, what's behind that is their very indulgence in sin. So we need to make sure as brothers and sisters of Christ that we are not walking in that sin, not walking in such a way we, where we are suffering as the world does. And this is the distinguishing mark of worldly and Christian suffering by what's behind it, whether it's your sinful passions or your desire to be faithful to God. Therefore, if you encounter suffering as a Christian, Peter says to not be ashamed or to be discouraged because if we suffer as Christians, that shows us that we belong to Christ. This was a great encouragement for Paul and Silas. It was awful to go through, but it was a great encouragement for them because they knew they were not suffering because of their sinfulness, but rather they were suffering as Christians. And therefore, they were not ashamed, and they were not discouraged from preaching the gospel. Our willingness to endure the shame that the world throws at us ought to be an encouragement for us. Your willingness to stand up against what the world will bring ought to encourage you. The distinguisher of suffering is the person suffering for their, their own sinful actions without seeing the need for repentance, which leads to them blaming other people. That's how the world suffers. They suffer and they say, oh, this is awful, I'm going through this, but it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's your fault, it's not mine. It's my parents' fault for how they raised me. It's the school's fault for kicking me out for burning a Bible. It's whatever. That's how the world suffers. But the one who suffers as a Christian finds joy and peace in that suffering because their eyes are are not fixed on the situation that they're in, but on Christ the King. Brothers and sisters, how we suffer or how you respond to suffering depends on where your eyes are fixed. Are your eyes fixed on the world in your suffering, leading, leading you to deny any responsibility and to blame others? Or are your eyes fixed on Christ, meaning that you can take whatever the world throws at you and say, my peace and my joy are firmly fixed in Christ my King. 
In Acts chapter 5, verses 41 to 42, we see this happening. The apostles are brought before the council in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, and they are ridiculed, shamed, and beaten. But they go out from that, that, that uh, hearing, if you will, joyful. And they, they, they go out joyful because they were, they were um, able to suffer dishonor for the name of Christ. They were able to suffer rightly as Christians. That, that's our focus, brothers and sisters. So how do we prepare for suffering? Let me finish with this. We'll go quick. In preparation for his coming suffering, Jesus took his disciples to his favorite place of prayer. In the quiet garden, away from the bustle of the city and the constant crowds, Jesus sought the presence of the Father. You see, Jesus knew that if he was to endure the torture of the coming days, he needed to fix his eyes on the source of his strength. And I think this was written for us, to serve as a pattern for us to follow. So how do we prepare? We follow in the footsteps of our king. Because as our king was subjected to humiliation, so will his followers be subjected to, humil to humiliation. And we need to follow the same pattern of Jesus. We need to understand that our, our battle is not against the flesh and, and blood, but is against the spiritual forces of power that are at work in this world. Therefore, we need, brothers and sisters, we need to go to our place of prayer. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to be in fellowship with one another so that we may have the strength to stand against the suffering that's going to come in our lives, against the persecution that's going to come from our employer for us being Christian, against our, our unbelieving spouse who, who constantly ridicules us for our belief, or even against our parents who look down upon us for believing in Christ or our neighbors, or wherever it is going to come from, we need to ensure that we are fixing our eyes upon the source of our strength, and that we are banding together as the body of Christ, considering how to stir one another up to faithfulness and good works. Brothers and sisters, if we are to stand, if we are to endure the suffering, we must do it by following the pattern of Christ and fixing our eyes on the source of our strength. Therefore, seek to fix your eyes on the king, having done all you can to stand firm. Make sure you live up, brothers and sisters, make sure you live up to the reputation of a disciple of Jesus and suffer well for your king. Develop in your life, listen, develop in your life daily disciplines of Bible reading, of prayer, and of regular fellowship with the saints so that you are equipped to stand. Nobody can do this alone. Nobody can do this in isolation. And you sure cannot do this without knowing your Bible. Therefore, you must spend time in the Word as much as as is possible. And I get it, it's difficult. There's lots of distractions in this world. But brothers and sisters, make a point to build daily disciplines in your life. For if we deny Jesus before men, he will deny us before his Father. Brothers and sisters, we have a king that came and died for us and is now at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us us, proclaiming his blood upon everybody who calls upon his name. Therefore, take joy that although the storm comes, you're not in it alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you have brought us out of darkness and into your marvelous light, for you are our king, Lord, and we love you. But we fall short often. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us with your Holy Spirit to walk faithfully, 
to seek you in every aspect of our lives, to stop separating our lives into, oh, this is secular and this is sacred, but Lord, may we walk in everything being sacred because we are new creations in Christ. Lord, thank you for your mercy. As we celebrate the table this morning, Lord, I pray that you be here with us as you always are, speaking and walking with us, teaching our hearts, for we are your children, and it is to you that we fix our eyes, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.